STM32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this section, we will focus on the library's repository management. I would like to demonstrate to you how to configure properly and manage libraries which you are using during work with STM32 Cube IDE. Let's start STM32 Cube IDE. I would select one of already existing workspaces, which would contain at least one active project. Now on the screen we can see uh, the workspace with three projects. One of those is active. This is G0 underscore PWM. So let's start first uh, with the configuration of repository location and uh, internet connection. So to do this, uh, let's go to Window, Preferences, STM32 Cube. And from this uh, set of uh, settings, uh, let's select firmware update. Within firmware updater, we can select the firmware installation repository. So this is the location of all CoolCube libraries which you are using during your development. By default, uh, after the installation of this STM32 Cube IDE, there is a quite long path selected, so I would suggest to, to, to select it according to your needs, to your preferences later on. Within this window you can select as well the connection mode. Offline mode means that uh, your application will not connect uh, to the internet all the time, so it can work offline. Then uh, checked automatic settings, I would suggest to select the manual check, just to avoid any, any delay during the startup of the application, and uh, select no auto refresh at application start just to save some time during startup of co complete application you can check as well whether uh, there is a proper connection of your uh, application to the servers to grab data so we just can just press check connection and if everything is okay you should see this uh, okay icon on the button in case uh, there is a uh, X button, uh, X mark, it means that there is something wrong uh, with the connection. Please have a look into these network connections and configure properly uh, your proxy entries, if any. Proxy settings uh, you can collect from your IT department. One important point within this uh, firmware updater settings is that you can perform the firmware installation repository configuration only in the case if there is no active device configuration project. In fact, device configuration file. So, for example, if I would open the IOC file for this project, and I will go to Window Preferences, you see, Firmware installation repository is inaccessible right now and there is a warning that we should close IOC editor. Okay, so I close it. I come back to this again and now I can edit. Now let's have a look on the repository uh, management. How we can add, how we can remove libraries, how we can update them. To do this, uh, we need to go to help and select Manage Embedded Software Packages. As you can see at the moment, it is inaccessible for us, which means that we need to open any of the IOC files to make our device configuration or STM32 CubeMX application running. Okay, so now we see some IOC file opened. Now, if we go to Help, we can see Manage Embedded Software Packages active. Okay, I select this option. And now uh, I can see the new window, which contains uh, two tabs, STM32 Cube MCU packages, which is related to the Cube libraries for all STM32 devices. And there is another tab, STMicroelectronics, which contains some additional packages related to additional components coming from ST, like uh, BLE uh, sensors, uh, MEMS sensors, NFC uh, components. Uh, so those are the software packages which allows uh, communication, which allows cooperation between STM32 devices and uh, some additional uh, components. We will focus on STM32 Cube MCU packages and let's go to the G0 section. I will just unscroll it. 
I can see at the moment, uh, if I sc will scroll down, I can see that uh, within STM32G0, there are three libraries available. Version 1.00, then 1.1.0 and 1.2.0. The most up-to-date one is 1.2.0 and uh, this one is already installed in my repository. This is visible by this uh, green uh, s uh, square over here. Uh, I can download uh, uh, another one. I just press uh, within the another square. Uh, this uh, marking means that this library has been selected and can be installed now. To install this library, I, c I need to go below and press this Install Now button. To remove the library, I need to mark it first. It will uh, have this red X on it. And then I need to press Remove Now. OK. Uh, sometimes uh, it is not possible to perform the installation of the library online. Uh, this is why it is possible as well to install the libraries offline using uh, already downloaded zip files. All of the libraries are stored uh, on ST servers as a zip files. Those can be downloaded separately uh, from the web. And then once you've got such a zip file, you can install it from this uh, from this point using this from local option in this case you are just selecting the location of this zip file press open and it will be installed uh, automatically we can check as well the available updates on existing libraries um, on the tool itself to do this we need to go to help check for updates in my case there is one update available i can check by using this refresh, whether there is something new coming. There is no other update, so I can decide to install it, just selecting this and press Install Now, or ignore it. I would select the second option, I will not use this uh, library for a while. This help check for updates is important if you select that within your repository configuration, manual check for updates, because it allows you to check whether there is something new, something more updated uh, within the tools uh, you're using in the time which is most uh, suitable for you. Thank you for watching this video. Welcome on our STM32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this part, uh, we'll try to convert our existing example from HAL to low layer. We will reuse our existing external interrupt hands on session, which has been fully done using HAL libraries, hardware abstraction layer libraries, and we will change it to low layer. So, in this project, we have configured already two GPIOs, one is output to control LED, the second one is an external interrupt which is connected to our blue button on the board. We configured as well the nested vector interrupt controller NVIC uh, to accept interrupts from the external pin. But now we will reuse this configuration and transfer everything to low layer uh, to check what is what is the difference between those two approaches. OK, I have just opened stm 32 cube IDE. I'm opening the project for external interrupts. And I'm opening G0 external interrupt IOC file by just double clicking to open the device configuration tool. The project is done, it's ready. We do not need to change anything within the pinout, within the clock configuration. So again, we've got the PC13 is uh, configured as GPIO underscore external interrupt, uh, line 13, and its label is blue underscore button. And then PA5 is configured as GPIO underscore output, and its label is LED underscore green. Additionally, we have selected SWD interface as a debug one, and we have not changed anything in a clock configuration. So we are working on a internal 
oscillator HSI 16 MHz, which is clocking the complete system. The only difference, which we'll do right now, is a difference within the project manager. We go to the from project to the advanced settings, and for each of those two modules, RCC and GPIO, we will switch from hull to low layer. I just click on this hull and select low layer instead. The same for GPIO. Once done it, I will generate the code. So I just press Ctrl S, Ctrl Save. And now I need to regenerate the project. So I click this gear icon to generate the new project using low layer libraries. I can see some action on the left side. Now if I will go into the HAL uh, driver, within includes I can see instead of HAL, uh, drive, HAL files, I can see low layer ones. So the structure of the name for the file is the following. Name of the family, underscore, type of the library, in our case low layer, underscore, name of the peripheral. Most of the functions, in fact macros, to control the peripherals are stored in the header files as a macros. As a macros which are operating on particular registers. The idea behind uh, the low layer macros and functions is that uh, each function, each macro, is operating on single register. Okay, let's uh, have a look uh, on our source file main.c. Okay, we can see still this user code, begin user code and uh, sections. We can see still our flag, which was uh, between the user code section, so it was not deleted. Additionally, we can see some new functions, like uh, enabling the clock to system config and power. And uh, we still can see um, our HAL function to toggle the LED, because it was within the user code area. If I would try now to compile the code using the hammer, I can see two errors. If I would inspect it, I can see that uh, HAL functions is not recognizable, because we switched the library from HAL to low layer. I would comment it out, and then I will try to find a similar function within low layer library. So I'm starting low layer underscore GPIO underscore control space and sorry underscore control space and um, oh there is exactly the same function same name toggle pin and again we need to specify the port and the pin mask for this I would reuse the arguments from above Now it should be should be okay. Let me spend a while on uh, definitions of those of those macros. Uh, we can find them within main.h file. As you can see, that green pin uh, has been transferred to ll underscore gpio pin five, and port is the same. If you would change to hal again. Those definitions would be changed as well. Uh, instead, this ll underscore GPIO pin 13, we will have only GPIO pin 13 and GPIO pin 5. So the application during the code generation is uh, handling on all of the definitions uh, which has been uh, developed by us during the device configuration. Okay, so we have the main uh, while one loop ready. Next point would be implementation of the interrupt procedure. In the HAL version, we were using this uh, callback, which would be not used anymore. So I would comment it out, because uh, the, the structure of the interrupts uh, handling is pretty different here. So let's go to interrupt uh, vector uh, file, when we've got all the procedures of active interrupts. And again, we've got some system ones, like NMI, Hardfold, SVC, PentSV, and Sysdig. And we've got our IRQ handler for external interrupts. So, as you can see, again, 
uh, everything is done for us. I mean, detection of uh, source of the interrupt and clearing the flag. But instead of calling additional function, everything is done. Uh, everything is done within this uh, uh, this file. So we've got one call uh, less in the in the hierarchy of the interrupt handling process. So the only thing we need to do is to set our flag. Flag set to one, but we need to import it from our main file. This is why I will go here above this file and I would just import it extern. Okay. Now let's try to build it again. No errors, no warnings. And let's start the debug session. I press the play or resume button and uh, I'm pressing now the blue button and each blue button is changing the state of our green LED. So the application is working uh, properly. I terminate the code execution and now application is still in flash so I can still play with the with the port. Thank you for watching this video. Hello and welcome on our STM32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this part I would like to demonstrate to you some basic components concerning project management within the workspace. How the projects are organized, how to switch between them, how to switch to different workspace, what are the key features and which can help uh, you on day-by-day -day development. So the objectives. Uh, we will demonstrate how to manage the projects within stm 32 cube IDE. Uh, we will explore some project settings, basic ones, where to find the ma main most important ones. I would like to demonstrate to you how to share the project with uh, others uh, using import-export features, how to switch to another, another uh, workspace and uh, how to restore some default settings by resetting the perspective. So let's start uh, from the beginning. Projects with an STM32 CubeID as it is an Eclipse-based uh, environment, we are working on a workspace which can contain one or more uh, pr projects. Within the workspace we can perform some basic operation on the projects. We can switch, with, switch between them, we can make them active uh, or disactive, we can close project, we can delete the project, we can delete the project as well from the file system. So all of those features are uh, available. Let's start uh, with uh, the basic uh, concept, uh, project opening, project closing. As I told you before, uh, only one project can be active at the moment, but uh, many of the projects can be opened. There is a big risk that uh, if you have opened uh, more than one project and uh, from each project you've got opened some files, it can be difficult uh, to, um, to manage it. Uh, it, can, it may happen that uh, you will edit some files uh, from the project which is not uh, currently active. It can create some mess. This is why there is a good feature within uh, Eclipse and it is available as well within stm 32 uh, which is um, closing and opening the projects. The feature to, to, uh, which allows you to close and open the project. On the left part of the screen you can see the example of the workspace, which contains uh, seven projects. Uh, one of those is open. This G0 LED uh, is open. Uh, to close this project, it is enough uh, to click on its name, then click the uh, right uh, button on mouse and select close project. In this case, uh, you will see the situation like on the, in the middle of the screen, that all projects are closed. To open the project, it's enough to double-click the, on the name of the project and then it becomes an open and uh, in the same time active.
What is good is that once you click, uh, when you close the project, all open uh, opened files which are related to this project are closed automatically. Here you can see it on the screen that we've got the main.c and the IOC file related uh, to G0 LED opened. Once you select the close of this of this project, those files are closed as well. Here is a more difficult example uh, when we've got uh, three main.c files opened in the same time from different projects and we've got uh, seven open projects at the same at the same time of course only one is active but sometimes it's quite difficult to change to check which one or which main.c file uh, is uh, for which uh, project uh, just to to make uh, to make an order of it uh, we are selecting one project just clicking on its name then we are pressing the right button on mouse and we are selecting close unrelated projects all other are projects which are not uh, uh, this G0 underscore LED are closed automatically together with all files related to those projects. Only one main.c remains related to this G0 underscore LED and uh, we can continue uh, the development. To switch between, between the project is quite easy with an Eclipse and uh, stm 30 IDE, it is just enough to click uh, with the left button on mouse uh, on the project we would like to make active and uh, there would be automatic switch from one project to uh, the other. How to check the properties of the, of the project? Uh, it is enough to highlight its name so we click on its name, then we click on the right uh, button on mouse and select from the bottom of the of the menu properties. In this case, a new window would pop up with title properties for and name of the project. In our case, G0 underscore LED. And uh, within this window, we've got uh, all the settings available. Uh, for the project. Within CC++ build uh, we can select for example uh, configure the enable the parallel build of the application uh, so in case you've got uh, the stronger PC uh, stronger uh, multi-core CPU you can you can select uh, the enable parallel build and uh, uh, for example use optimal jobs which are optimal for your uh, for your application uh, then uh, within uh, CC++ build settings uh, you've got all uh, important settings concerning the tools which we are using to uh, generate uh, generate the code. So uh, starting from the MCU settings um, you can select the floating point unit which is used, instruction set which is used, runtime library um, which is very important because because it allows you to reduce the code which would be used by the, your application if you are not using all the features uh, from the, uh, the, the the standard libraries you can select for example nano library which is much smaller and uh, will not uh, increase the code of your project uh, drastically so this is the uh, MCU uh, settings. Then uh, from the next option, MCU post build outputs, you can uh, select what kind of output files you would like to have uh, as a result of the build uh, of, the, of the project. So you can uh, generate binaries, uh, hexadecimal uh, hex, hex files or uh, Motorola, um, S, uh, Motorola S files. So those are the options. So you can as well uh, display information about the size of generated code and uh, you can select or unselect the uh, generation of the list file. Within tool settings you can configure as well assembler, C compiler, and uh, linker which is used to build your application. So this is the place when you can specify the optimization level, you can specify uh, some additional definitions which are used uh, within the preprocessor, you can specify some additional include paths um, or some other components which are uh, used by the compiler or linker or assembler. If you would like to share the project with others or uh, just uh, store the project uh, in some external repository, we can do it 
using export uh, option, which is uh, uh, as well the the feature of the Eclipse environment. To do this, um, we will need to go within the workspace to File Export. As a result, uh, we will see an export window. From this, uh, we need to select uh, from General uh, section either archive file if you would like to store our project in a compressed form zip or tar uh, or file system if you would like to store the project uh, in some folder i will demonstrate uh, the feature with archive file of zip so general archive file then uh, window will change and it will display all available i mean opened uh, projects with an active uh, workspace. In our case uh, we've got uh, seven of them. Uh, we can select which projects we would like to export into the file and then we need to specify the ERHA file. This is this window below. We need to press browse and select the ERHA name. Uh, then we need to specify what would be the format. It can be zip, it can be tar. Um, I would use zip uh, a zip file and then once you do all those operation operations you need to press finish having this zip file you can share it within uh, other mem team members uh, from your, from your team and it would be possible to import it, import it uh, from different um, uh, workspace to import the file uh, in within the workspace you need to uh, to go to File Import option and from General you can select uh, what would you would you like to import. Uh, within stm 32 cube IDE you have an option to import an archive file, existing projects into workspace, so the cube IDE uh, projects, uh, file system, import uh, AC6 system workbench for stm 32 projects or Atolic True Studio project. In our case, we will try to import the same file we have just exported. Uh, so we'll select General Existing Project into Workspace. Uh, then we need to select either root directory, if the project is stored as a file folder, and not, uh, not a zip, or uh, if it's uh, select if it's uh, stored in an archive file, we need to select this select archive file and browse it. I can select interesting projects for me and then press the finish button. As a result, all of the projects are popping up in my active uh, workspace. Another, another thing uh, which is quite convenient within uh, stm 32 cube ID, it's coming from Eclipse, it's uh, switching the workspaces. Uh, we can imagine the situation that we are working on several projects or several workspaces and uh, to switch between them uh, it's quite easy. It's uh, just enough to go to File and switch Workspace and um, as a result you can see the list of recently used workspaces and the option Other which allows you to uh, select a different location of the workspace which is already existing. Another important point uh, once you're working with uh, stm 32 cube ID um, is a perspective management. The perspective uh, is a set of windows uh, which are used uh, in the current uh, step of the of the development. Um, we can have uh, three main perspectives uh, within stm 32 cube ID. The uh, first one is a uh, device device configuration, which is very similar. In fact, it's based on stm 32 cube mix. Uh, device configurator. The second one is a CC++ perspective which is used to code development, its compilation, its build. Uh, and uh, the third one is a debug configuration which is used for the uh, debug purposes. It might happen that uh, once you are working on a the configuration on the we are working on a perspective you close uh, too many you close too many too many windows uh, change uh, the, the, the configuration in such a way that um, not everything is visible uh, it is easy to restore the default perspective view uh, from from the from the application by using window perspective reset perspective option uh, which would uh, restore the perspective view to its default uh, configuration. 
In this part, I would like to demonstrate projects management within STM32Cube IDE. So the first thing uh, I would like to demonstrate how we can manage projects within STM32Cube IDE workspace. Then we will explore, explore a bit uh, project settings and uh, demonstrate how to uh, share the projects with others using import-export features and uh, some additional points, uh, some additional features which can be uh, useful during your um, project development. Let's uh, switch to the workspace. I would use uh, for this demonstration purposes one of the existing uh, workspace. Uh, it contains all of the hands-ons uh, which uh, are prepared for this uh, Cube ID uh, basic sessions. You can find them in the training materials in the zip file as well. So we can we can uh, duplicate. Uh, here on the workspace you can see several projects. Uh, all of them are closed at the moment. Uh, to open the project, it is just enough to double click on it. I just double click on this G0 underscore XTI. This project uh, became opened and active. Active means that if I would uh, uh, press on it, I would press on the hammer. Uh, only this project would be built. Important point is that active uh, open project uh, can be exported later on. All closed project closed projects are not handled uh, within export operation, which we'll discuss a bit later on. To close the project, we need to click the right button on mouse and select close project. Important point is that when you close the project, you are closing all the files related to this project. I will demonstrate now this feature, just opening a few files, a few projects. I opened three main.c files from different projects. Uh, it is creating, uh, it could create some problems during our development. What we can do uh, here, we can use this close project feature. Uh, let's assume the situation that we would like to continue development on G0 underscore PWM project. What I can do, I can just click right uh, on right button on mouse and select close unrelated projects. Please have a look uh, what it will be done. All the, pro all the other projects has been closed and all the files related to those projects are closed as well. Only main.c file from g0 underscore pwm file is opened and can be edited. To delete the project, uh, we just need to delete, uh, click on the, on the project and press delete. It will be deleted from the workspace. But to delete the project, we just need to either click on right button on mouse and select delete or just select the, the project and press delete button. Um, if we just click OK, the project would be deleted from the workspace without, uh, and it will be not deleted from the file system. We can as well uh, select this delete project content on disk, and then the project would be deleted physically from the disk. We'll skip this process, um, and now we will focus for a while on the project properties. If we select the active project, in our case it will be G0PWM. I press the right button on mouse and select the last option, last position from the menu, it is Properties. A new window will be displayed on the screen. Its title is Properties for and name of the project, in our case G0 underscore PWM. Within this uh, window we can perform some uh, configuration of the, of the project, uh, starting from uh, selection how the build process should be done. If we are using multi-core uh, um, PC, we can select enable parallel build and uh, select the number of the jobs which can be done build process in parallel. So in, in my case it will be four uh, jobs in parallel done during the build process. So this is the, the, the first point. Then within the settings 
Uh, next option I would like to discuss is uh, settings within the CC++ build. Uh, here, in uh, tool settings, we've got complete set of the parameters used by the uh, assembler, compiler, linker, but as well uh, you can find here some settings about the MCU or post build op uh, uh, options which can be useful for your development. Within the MCU settings you can select the floating point unit which is used in your application, you can select the instruction set or runtime library. The sliced option is very uh, important uh, uh, point because you can select the reduced C uh, library or standard C library. The difference is that uh, in a reduced C libraries uh, you have uh, reduced functionality, reduced uh, number of the functions or simplified functions, but um, the uh, size of the uh, standard library is much much smaller so the application uh, in the final build uh, will be uh, smaller. So this is the first uh, important point. The second option uh, MCU post build outputs allows you to select what kind of output files you will have after build of your application. You can have a binary file, Intel hex file, Motorola S record file, or Verilog file. So you can select it. Uh, you can select more than one. Uh, you can uh, select as well to display information about the size uh, of the build uh, project. It is done by default. And you can select on unselect generation of the list file. Then you have uh, three main big sections uh, concerning assembler, C compiler and linker. Uh, within those sections you can set some additional settings for those components. Uh, most important ones are within the C compiler. So, for example, you can select the optimization level, which is by default none, so zero. Um, you can mm, modify the include paths, you can add something something new. You can add some defined symbols within the preprocessor. You can specify the debug level from none to maximum uh, with the number of the information which would be generated during the debug uh, session available during the debug session. And those are the main uh, settings which are available for the project. Of course there are much more than than this but uh, for the complete set you can you can refer to the to the manual uh, for the for this for this tool. Next point I would like to discuss uh, in this in this section is um, about um, the comfort of work with this within this environment. So what we can see right now on the screen is so-called C++ perspective. It is slightly modified by myself. So I already closed some windows. I can close more. Um, and it may happen that during your development you click too much, uh, you closed too much windows and uh, you don't know how to come back to the default state. For this uh, you can go to Window, Perspective, Reset Perspective. Yes, and now as a as a result, current perspective will come back to its default default settings. Another thing I would like to demonstrate to you is to how to export and import projects within the workspace. In our current workspace, we've got two open projects; the rest are closed. So let's uh, select the export option. So I go I will go File Export. I can select uh, either archive file or file system or preferences. File system uh, will store the project uh, within its uh, within the separate folder of the folder structure, which is present in the in the project. I would select the archive file, which allow me to store everything in one single file, uh, either zipped or uh, tar format. I press next. As you can see, only active, only open, uh, sorry, only open projects are uh, available to be exported. I can select which of those I would like to export uh, to the archive file. It can be in zip format, it can be in tar format. I would select zip. I would put it on the desktop. And now, if I would go to the desktop, I can see uh, one zip file with the those two projects. It is possible as well to export the 
particular project from the workspace. I just click on the project to make it active. Then I click uh, right button on mouse and select export. And again, I have file next. By default, there is only one selection of the file which I clicked on and I can continue with uh, exporting it to the uh, to separate file. Let's call it like this and finish. OK, let's try to make an opposite operation. So I would uh, switch to different workspace, to new one. So I would go to File, Switch Workspace, Other, and I would call it Cube IDE 5. It takes some time. The Cube IDE is restarting. OK, it's, it's restarting within new workspace cube IDE5, which we can see here on top. Um, we'll close this information center, or I can click import project. As I exported all the projects within the zip file, I would use as an import source archive. I will go to desktop, and I would select the first file, MOOC1. You remember there were, in fact, uh, to projects. I can click Finish and I can see both projects on the screen. We can open previously exported projects a bit differently. Let me delete those two uh, projects from this workspace. So I will delete it one by one. Okay, and now uh, I would select from the file open projects from the file system. Again, I will select RHAF, RHAF and select MOOC1. Yes. And you see the effect is exactly the same. Thank you for watching this video. Welcome on our STM32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this part, we will focus on power consumption calculator. This is a part of STM32 Cube IDE application, which allows us to estimate the power consumption of our application. To demonstrate this uh, application, I would create a new project with an existing workspace. So I'll go to File, New, STM32 Project. So again, I'm going uh, through STM32 target selector. We can do, of course, uh, some estimation of uh, current consumption for existing project, but uh, in this case, I would like to demonstrate something, uh, some particular settings. Okay, so we select uh, exactly the same microcontroller, G071RB. Yes, and uh, RQFP version, I just press next. Uh, I would name it uh, G0 PCC. All the settings are the same, default ones. Yes, Cubemix or device configuration perspective would be opened. Okay, so we've got empty project. Again, I would uh, select serial wire as a debug interface. Um, in our application, I would select as well RTC. Activate clock source uh, with wake up. Activate calendar with a wake up capability because I would like to demonstrate to you this power consumption calculator in connection with low power modes. So let's assume that we will use RTC uh, with internal wake up. We will use as well PC13 in the configuration of um, 
system wake up tool as well and uh, additionally we will select ADC1 with some channels measurements so let's select two channels and uh, from communication peripherals let's select uh, low power to ward 1 in asynchronous mode 9600 bits per second 7 let's do 8 bits including parity without parity one stop bit the rest remains the same for the clock configuration i would keep the default settings i would not focus on much on the on the configuration and uh, i switching to power consumption calculator for this particular application my idea is to demonstrate to you the some typical application, low power application, uh, which should perform some analog measurements from time to time, receive, uh, transmit some data over the UART, and uh, wake up periodically using uh, RTC auto wake up functionality or a dedicated pin uh, connected to PC13. Before we go further, let's uh, save our application, Ctrl S. Yes, it will generate the code. And now let's switch to Tools and Power Consumption uh, Calculator. We can start with uh, VDD selection. Uh, it can be 1.8, uh, 2.4303.6 volts. Uh, let's select uh, 3 volts. Temperature cannot, cannot be changed. And now we can select the battery, which we'll use uh, to work with this uh, with our application. So when I press Select, a new window pop up when I can either add my own battery which can be specified by me or I can select uh, already existing and defined batteries I would select uh, classical AA1 it's 1.5 volts this is why I need two of those I could put here two in series I can increase as well uh, the capacity in milli I can put some of those in parallel as well. This application allows me to estimate how much time I can work with my application using specified set of batteries. Next point is a definition of the steps, so how the application will work. To do this, uh, I select a new step. As a result, this kind of window is popping up. I select um, the power mode so either run or any of low power modes so usually at the beginning we are in a run mode to configure the, all the peripherals and now I can enable all the peripherals which has been enabled by me uh, within the pinout and configuration phase I would select this so as you can see uh, we've got uh, IDC, GPIO-A, GPIO-C uh, low power UART and RTC having this uh, uh, we can continue, so power range uh, with an STM32G0 we've got two power ranges, medium and high more information about uh, the power range available in G0 family you can find on dedicated online training I would select the range to medium which allows me to limit the current consumption so as we enabled all the peripherals which has been selected by us in the previous step we can continue our evaluation so power range will set to medium to lower the total current consumption of the system memory fetch type uh, we will use flash standard one uh, the VDD is already programmed uh, voltage source is battery CPU frequency we will use uh, 2 megahertz to lower the, the power consumption uh, clock configuration we will use HSI because we are using internal clock and step duration, so how long we will be in this run mode at the beginning, I would set on 10 milliseconds. Uh, we can specify as well some additional current consumption, which can be related to connected peripherals, connected uh, chips uh, to our microcontroller. Uh, so I would keep it uh, like this without any, any additional points. We've got the step, step consumption, more or less uh, 500 uh, microamps. I press add. 
and I can see on the screen right now the current consumption in time. So right now it is IDD by step, so this step only. We can see right now the current consumption within one step. If we will use only this step, uh, we can count on our battery for 7 months, 22 days and 1 hour. Ok, but uh, we discussed at the beginning that I would like to create a low power application. This is why I would add a new step. And within this new step I would select the stop mode. Stop 1. Stop 1 uh, mode with active uh, RTC only. And uh, I would like to be in this state for one second without any additional current consumption. I'm adding this amount as well. And after this one second, uh, I would like to uh, be in run mode again. But before this, uh, I would like to show to you right now how our consumption profile has changed. Please have a look. Right now we've got all two steps, run and stop, and we've got the average current consumption curve which is on the level of 12 microamperes. OK, so we create the next new step. So this time it would be wake up from stop. We cannot select run mode or sleep mode or other modes because we need to wake up, first wake up from a stop mode. Uh, so this is quite, auto quite automatic uh, mode. Uh, so I just edit and after wake up from stop I can add run mode again. So new step, I'm selecting run, uh, memory flash from memory fetch from flash and again ADC. Well, I can enable all the peripherals from the pinout, but this time I would like to be in this mode only for one millisecond. Above 2 megahertz, clock configuration HSI, one millisecond, and okay, so we've got uh, four steps. Um, we can save the sequence, we can load other sequence, we can compare the sequence with the other ones, we can display the sequence as well. We can have a look uh, how much time uh, we can work on the batteries we selected. So if we keep this scenario like this, uh, we can work with these batteries uh, 13 years, 2 months, 23 days and 7 hours. Average current consumption is uh, 12.7 microamps. We can select uh, the different uh, display of this uh, profile. So for example, we can can so select uh, IP con consumption, so in split on IDCs and uh, IGPIO, UART, so all the peripherals we are using in microamps. Uh, there is a split on digital and analog part, which is important in uh, components uh, like IDC or uh, reference voltage uh, used by the IDC. Um, we can select only analog, we can select only digital uh, peripherals, uh, we've got uh, split between run and low power modes, so there are various number of um, display of the, of the information. Then we can save it, we can print it uh, for further use. Uh, what is good in this application is that this power consumption calculator allows you to estimate to estimate the current consumption uh, of the application, how it is working, and uh, the, all the data which are used within this application are taken from the data sheet. So in the real application uh, you can be sure that uh, your data, your realistic data, would be very, very similar. So this is very good help if you would like to start with the new development and just check whether the selected microcontroller is appropriate or not uh, to your uh, application. Thank you for watching this video.
welcome on our STM32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this section, we will create a DC example using DMA transfers of the conversion results. A DC will be triggered by the timer events. For all of those uh, actions, we will use HAL library. We will start with uh, launching STM32 Cube IDE. We can use uh, existing uh, workspace or we can create a new one. And we will create a new project for STM32G071 microcontroller. I will create a new project uh, within existing workspace. So I go to File, New, STM32 project. To we'll start with the target selection. So our, our microcontroller is uh, STM32G071RB LQFP64 package, which is uh, present on a Nucleo board. Our project name uh, could be, for example, G0ADCDMA. And I would use uh, C language, executable binary file, and the project type STM32 cube. I would keep uh, the rest uh, as a default settings. Let's wait a minute uh, till the device configuration would be started. Okay, we've got the device configuration window. Uh, in front of us there is our microcontroller and uh, it's, uh, it's pin out. Uh, so let's start uh, uh, from selecting the debug interface. So I go to system core, assess and uh, seri serial wire. I can see PA13 and 14 selected as a debug interfaces. Then uh, let's select the analog uh, channel. So I go to analog section, ADC1. I scroll down to select the inter internal temperature sensor. We cannot see any change on the pinout because it's internal. And I need to put some configuration for the ADC. So let's go to the parameter settings uh, first, and uh, let's select uh, let's select uh, some basic uh, settings. Uh, we will keep uh, the clock prescaler to synchronous clock uh, mode divided by two. It means that um, our uh, ADC would be clocked by the system clock. Uh, divided by 2. Our system clock uh, is uh, HSI 16 MHz, which we can verify in a clock configuration. So this is this this is our system clock, 16 MHz, and ADC clock MOOCs, uh, it is this one. This, uh, this selector, it is used for the ADC clock. Uh, at the moment we can see that it's clocked by the system clock, and additionally we are dividing this clock by uh, 2. It means that ADC would be clocked by 8 MHz, which is important to select the proper uh, sampling time uh, parameters. Let's go further. We need to set uh, the sampling time for selected channel. We've got two sampling times, in fact. Uh, we can select two uh, different uh, sampling times for two different uh, groups of channels which would be, would be sampled. In our case, there would be only one channel which would use, uh, for example, sampling, sampling time uh, common one. By default, uh, there is a smallest possible value there. It's 1.5 uh, clock cycles, uh, which is uh, far too fast um, for our temperature sensor. But uh, to have the exact value, we need to uh, go to uh, the documentation of our uh, microcontroller. How to reach uh, documentation to our mi microcontroller? In the meantime, I have opened a uh, datasheet uh, for our STM32G071 uh, microcontroller. Let's try uh, to find uh, the proper value of the sampling time of our temperature sensor. For this purpose, uh, we'll have a look at uh, into the electrical characteristics and operating conditions. From within this list, uh, there should be one chapter concerning temperature sensors characteristics, like like here. Within this chapter, we can see some basic characteristics of our temperature sensor. On next page, we can find uh, the sampling time 
uh, for this temperature sensor, which is set as a minimum 5 microseconds, which is the 5 microseconds. Having this uh, 5 uh, microseconds as a minimum sampling time requested for internal temperature sensor, and uh, knowing that uh, our ADC would be clocked by 8 MHz, we can calculate easily that uh, we need at least 40 clock cycles of uh, this 8 MHz clock uh, to properly sample our ADC channel temperature sensor. Let's uh, have a look uh, which value would be the most uh, proper one. We do not have uh, 40 clock cycles. We've got 39.5, which is below this minimum value. This is why we will select the next one, so 79.5 clock uh, cycles as a sampling time. We are leaving the uh, the sampling time common to uh, not touched, as we will not use it. We will have uh, only one conversion, which is the temperature sensor, and uh, we need to specify as well the trigger conversion source. By default, it is software. Uh, we will change it uh, to uh, timer two, trigger out, and uh, we we'll select one of the edges. We can keep it like uh, like this. Let's scroll down the rank 1, which is the information about our channel. So we can see uh, it is uh, one channel, it is its name, it's a temperature sensor, and its sampling time is 79.5 clock cycles, which is the value we would like to, uh, to have. We keep uh, the rest of the parameters not touched, because we will not uh, use them. The next point uh, would be to uh, configure the DMA, which would be used to transfer the data from ADC to internal buffer within SRAM. So let's go to the DMA settings. There is nothing at the moment, so we click Add. Select the channel. There is only one DMA request, ADC1. We have uh, more than one channel available, because please remember that stm 32 g 0 contains DMA MOOC, so which allows us to select uh, different uh, DMA uh, channels for different peripherals. We've got uh, a lot of possibilities here. Let's select the default uh, configuration. Uh, the direction would be from peripheral to memory, because we will take the data from ADC and transfer them into the buffer within the SRAM. There would be only one DMA transfer, so let's keep the priority on the low level. Um, we will use only a single uh, set of the conversions, uh, so let's keep a mode uh, normal. It means that uh, after the last conversion, um, the DMA transfer would be stopped, uh, and uh, uh, we will stop on the last uh, on the last uh, component within the buffer. A data width, uh, let's uh, keep uh, as a half word because we will transfer 12-bit data and uh, we would increment uh, the address on memory side. The rest of the parameters we will keep uh, not touched. So that's it uh, for ADC configuration. Next step would be the configuration of the timer, which would trigger our ADC uh, conversions. So let's go to the timers, timer 2, and uh, let's select uh, the clock source for this timer as an internal clock. We will not use uh, any, any channels, uh, because uh, uh, we will use only time base, so the overflows of the timer to trigger uh, the ADC and these ADC conversions. So let's uh, switch to the, to the configuration. And um, we need uh, to set uh, somehow the configuration of the timer to uh, trigger our ADC with the frequency of 1 Hz. How to configure our timer to work uh, with the frequency of 1 Hz on the output and trigger our ADC with this frequency? Let's have a look on the clock configuration once again. We see that uh, our system clock is uh, configured in, on 16 MHz, which is uh, transferred uh, to all of the peripherals. As we can see, our timer clock is as well 16 MHz. So we need uh, to divide somehow this 16 MHz in such a way to have 1 Hz at the end. Let's come back to the pinout configuration. And um, we've, got, uh, uh, we've got here a few possibilities. I would propose uh, the following uh, technique. Let's use a prescaler, which is 16-bit value, to 
rectify the clock as the first step. So I would propose uh, to divide it by 16,000. It is important to put here the value, uh, which is the desired value, minus 1, due to the fact that in the final calculation there is one edit to the value stored in this PSC part of the register. After this operation, we will have as input clock to the timer, to its counter, 1 kHz. So we need to divide this uh, 1 kHz somehow to have 1 Hz. To do this, uh, we are using a discounted period, which will be set to 1000. Uh, I put uh, the value 999 due to the fact that we are calculating from zero. So after this, uh, those two operations, uh, our timer would uh, overflow uh, with the frequency of 1 Hz, which is the desired, uh, desired uh, uh, value. This is the first part of the configuration of the timer. So we will have a timer which would overflow in the frequency of 1 Hz. Second step is to configure the trigger output, TRGO uh, pin uh, parameters. So the next point is to select properly the trigger output parameters. So first uh, we need to enable this master slave mode uh, to enable uh, triggering uh, another peripherals like ADC by this timer and then select the uh, source of this uh, trigger output signal. Uh, so we will change this reset which is default value to update event and on each overflow of the timer we will have a trigger pulse to uh, start a new conversion by uh, ADC. That's all operations uh, within the device configuration. We can generate the code. So I can simply save the project, so Control S. Yes. After a while, a project is generated. So we can go to our main.c file, which is the main file of our, our code. Okay, so we can see it is uh, initially pre-configured. All of the peripherals we just configured within the device configuration are initialized. What is missing is a calibration of ADC, then its start and the final configuration of its connection to DMA, and then as a final step, start of a timer tool, which would uh, trigger the ADC conversions. So let's uh, do it step by step. Let's start uh, from definition of the buffer we will use. Uh, to store the ADC uh, data. So the first uh, thing would be the definition of its maximum size. So I would call it as ADC buff size and I would set it to 8. Uh, please have a look that I'm putting the code within the user code sections just to be sure that uh, after the code regeneration uh, from the device configuration my uh, code would be not uh, deleted. Uh, so the next step would be the, the buffer itself. The buffer will be used to store the 12-bit data. Uh, so we, we will use a 16-bit um, size of its uh, basic component. And then let's name it ADC buffer and its uh, size will set to this uh, define, which we have defined a bit before. Okay, so this is the first step definition of the data where we will store the uh, temperature values. Okay, so next step uh, would be to calibrate uh, IDC. Uh, calibration is needed to remove the offset error and it should be run on each uh, power on of the application. So just after the uh, reset in our case. Uh, for this we've got a dedicated function within within the HAL, so if I would uh, use uh, HAL ADC EX, EX means uh, extended, it is special marking uh, for the functions within the HAL, which uh, means that uh, this particular function may differ from other similar functions uh, on different uh, different STM32 lines. If you do not see an EX uh, as a suffix in the function name, it means that this function can be copy-paste across the families without any change. 
In case of ADCs, uh, these calibration functions may differ from family to family. This is why we've got this EX uh, suffix at the end. Okay, so we, we need to select the proper function, calibration start. Then uh, the first argument, the only argument is uh, ADC1 handler, and that's it. To be sure that this calibration has been done properly, I would check it. So I would check whether this function has been executed correctly. If it's executed correctly, it should return the value HAL OK. So I would use simple if, and then if, uh, okay, so if it's not equal, it should execute the error handler function. This error handler function is uh, automatically generated by Cubemix as well. You can find it at the bottom of this uh, of this file. This function is defined uh, as, a, an, as an empty function, so you can put here an action which would be triggered in case of any problems with uh, HAL functions execution. Let's back to our uh, coding. Uh, so our ADC is uh, calibrated. ADC is calibrated, then the next step uh, would be to start uh, ADC. So let's uh, let's have a look for the options we've got. ADC, start, and we've got three options. We've got start, start DMA, start IT. Start uh, is a full polling mode, uh, start IT is with usage of interrupts, and start DMA is with usage with cooperation with DMA. So we are selecting this option and we need uh, to specify three arguments. The first one is a uh, handler to ADC we are using. So this is ADC HADC1. Then uh, there is a pointer to the buffer where the data should be stored and length of this buffer. So the first argument is a pointer. Then there should be the buffer name. So ADC buffer and its length. And again, uh, it would be good to check whether this function is executed correctly as well. This is why I'm adding this part of the code. Okay, and the last operation to start the process is to start the, the timer 2. To start the timer 2, we need to execute uh, the HAL function from a timer module which would start the time base. Time base means that uh, uh, we are using only the counter and its uh, overflows without uh, any action connected to input or output channels. So in our case, uh, we've got again start uh, time base, uh, start, start DMA, start IT. We don't care about the IT or DMA usage for the timer. So we are selecting the first function, the simplest one. The only argument we need to put here is a handler to this timer. So there is only one, timer two. And again, let's be sure that everything is correct with this function execution. This is why I'm adding this uh, checkup. Okay, and we are done. So this is the basic... Uh, piece of the code to start uh, our ADC conversion with usage of DMA and triggering uh, by the timer uh, timer 2. The source of the trigger has been done in a device configuration. In the code uh, we need to first do the calibration of ADC and then specify the buffer and its size and start both uh, peripherals. Okay, so the missing point is to process the interrupt which is related to our DMA transfer complete. The interrupt uh, call, it is managed uh, within the stm32g0xx underscore it.c file, where we will find uh, DMA1 channel 1 IRQ handler. This function is automatically generated by uh, the device configuration by stm32cube IDE. And um, it is calling uh, the function HAL DMA IRQ handler from our device. Uh, the HAL library is built in such a way that if we are using a DMI, 
usually it is assigned to one of the peripherals. Uh, there is a link uh, created between DMI and the peripheral with uh, which uh, DMI is working. So in such a case, uh, instead of uh, calling the callbacks uh, from the peripheral, in our case ADC, can be used instead. So what we need to do, it is defined within the halmsp.c file. If we go uh, to ADC MSP init function, you can see that uh, there is a configuration of DMA channel and uh, there is a macro called called HAL underscore link DMA which is connecting our ADC uh, with a DMA handler and uh, it's connecting in fact uh, the callbacks uh, from ADC which should be used uh, normally by its interrupts to callbacks uh, with callbacks from a DMA. As a result we can reuse uh, the, for example, ADC conversion complete callback from ADC as a final result of DMA transfer complete. Uh, knowing this, uh, we can add uh, the function within our main.c file. User code uh, uh, for a section is very good uh, for this. And we are adding the new uh, code. So, AJL uh, ADC conversion complete callback And uh, within this callback, uh, we can either stop ADC in DMA mode or timer two to not trigger uh, ADC uh, anymore. So I would stop. Uh, I will stop uh, ADC. So I'm selecting the function hal ADC stop, and again we've got a DMA option, and percent uh, and one. I'm checking whether this function is properly executed. If not, I will call error handler. Okay, so this uh, will give us only the, the option to really stop uh, the ADC operations once the buffer is full. In the next step, uh, we will try to post-process those data. So let's uh, s finish this uh, project at the moment. Uh, let's try to compile it. As the next step, we will connect our board and try to run the debug session. And let's observe what would be the result which we can gain uh, in the IDC buffer. Okay, I have my board uh, connected. The code is compiled. Let's try after connection of the board to run the debug session. So let's go to the debug session. I run it. The application will switch uh, to the debug perspective. Now I can uh, have a look on uh, the buffer. As you can see, now I can s have a look on its uh, value, current value, the base address, the type of it. So at the moment it contains only zeros. Uh, please remember that uh, our conversion will uh, last uh, 8 seconds. We've got a buffer which size is 8 elements and the frequency of the trigger is 1 Hz. It gave us 8 seconds. To be sure that we are just at the end of the conversion, let's put our breakpoint in a callback, which would be triggered in case of DMA transfer complete. OK, so i starting the execution of the code. Let's wait 8 seconds more or less. Okay, execution has uh, is finished at the moment. So now we can have a look on the on the buffer. So we can, for example, highlight it in this in this area. And uh, you see that the values are not the temperature ones. We need to convert it to the temperature. 
right now it's a pure reading uh, from IDC, it's a raw value, it's, it needs to be uh, to be converted. Uh, for this uh, we need a reference uh, voltage value, which is in our case the power supply of the board, which is 3.3 volts. And uh, we've got a special macro which can be used here to convert this value into the Celsius decrease. So now we will do this process. Okay, so the next uh, step would be to specify the flag which would be used uh, to uh, highlight uh, when there is a time to the conversion of the data. I would go into user code uh, section for the private variable and I would create one variable which is 8 bit uh, long and I would call it flag with initial value set to uh, 0. Then uh, I would uh, set this flag within our uh, DMA transfer complete, flag set to 1, and uh, based on this uh, value I would uh, trigger the uh, post-processing of ADC data within while one loop. So I would create here the if uh, loop flag, so if a flag is uh, equal to 1 we will do some uh, post-processing uh, and at the end of course we need to clear uh, the flag to not do the same operations all the time. Okay, let's try to find a function which would convert our data, uh, but before this uh, we will specify uh, the index which would be used uh, to convert the data from the buffer one by one. I would use the simplest possible uh, variable, 8 bit, because we've got only 8 uh, bit uh, data. IDX, I would uh, set the default, default value as a 0. And then we would create here the simple uh, for loop. For IDX equal to 0, then IDX less than IDC buff size. And IDX plus plus. Okay? So it create a simple uh, for a loop. Let's find the function or macro which would convert our uh, IDC row data into the temperature in Celsius decrease. A lot of such functions are stored uh, with an low layer modules for given peripheral. So let's start uh, from this uh, underscore, underscore low layer, which is the common name of the macros very useful macros to do simple operations, then the peripheral name like ADC underscore and control space. We can see here an um, interesting macro, ADC calc temperature. It looks uh, that it is something we are looking for. As a first argument it needs a uh, reference uh, analog voltage which has been used for the ADC then the raw data from ADC and resolution we have used during our measurements. Uh, let's have a closer look on this macro. So I would uh, click right uh, button on mouse and uh, open declaration. So the first argument is analog reference voltage in millivolts. So I would define this name within my, my code uh, in a section uh, private defines over here. I have measured this value, it's 3.3 .3 volts, in millivolts it would be 3300. And I would use this as the first argument of our macro. Okay, let's uh, go to the second. Second argument is um, conversion data measured by ADC. So this is our buffer. Our buffer is, this is the name of our buffer and uh, of course we need a single element, so IDX, and the third argument was the resolution. We have used 12 bits, so I will select the resolution 12 bits, like this, and of course we need to store the value in the buffer again. So we will just replace the old values, raw values, with the new ones. In the Celsius decrease. Okay, let's try to compile the code. And start the debug session. Uh, 
Okay, let's, um, that's the first point, let's remove the breakpoint from our uh, callback. I already did it, uh, so we don't need it in this place. We would need instead the callback in our while one loop uh, on the place when the flag would be cleared, which means that uh, it should be triggered once the conversion uh, the, con the, the conversion to the Celsius decrease is done. Okay, I double click on this line and I run the conversion. So first it would convert eight uh, data uh, from the temperature and sensor, and then uh, it will land in th this part of the code and convert it to the Celsius decrease. Okay, we are we are already there. Uh, so I would just highlight our ADC buffer and please have a look right now, instead of 900 something, we've got a value in the Celsius decrease. Please remember that this value is a temperature uh, of the silicon of the structure uh, within the microcontroller. It is not uh, the ambient temperature, it is the structure temperature. This is why it can be a bit higher than uh, what we feel, what we've got uh, in our environment. Okay, we can terminate uh, the session and that's it for this module. Thank you for watching this video. STM32Cube IDE Basics training session. In this section, uh, I will demonstrate how to use uh, USART uh, to send the data and how to uh, visualize it uh, using the terminal, which is built in within the STM32Cube IDE tool. So the objectives of uh, this part are the following. I will demonstrate how to configure the USART tool in unsynchronous mode to send the data, and then uh, how we can reuse existing connection between USART tool of our microcontroller from the Nucleo board to ST-Link, and uh, then to use a virtual COM port uh, on PC to, to communicate with the, with the micro. And then uh, we will reuse uh, existing uh, built-in terminal application, which uh, is a part of STM32Cube uh, IDE. Uh, let's start uh, from STM32Cube uh, IDE new project uh, creation. Uh, I would reuse uh, an existing uh, workspace, uh, which contains already several projects. I would create a new one uh, for our micro, so I go to File, New, STM32 project, and now I'm waiting for the uh, target selection window. I'm selecting STM32 G071 RB microcontroller, uh, so uh, it's enough to type uh, G071 RB. This is this one, and uh, we are selecting LQFP64 package version. So I create click next then the name of the project i would propose g0 usart and i will select c as a target language um, i would like to generate the executable binary type <coughs> and we will use stm32 cube on the, its device configuration to create the skeleton of the application let's uh, click finish uh, to start a device configuration window, which is in fact STM32 CubeMix, built in uh, with an STM32 Cube IDE uh, complete environment. So we see on the left side uh, that our new project is already created, G0 USART. It's an empty skeleton. Uh, so now we can see the complete pinout of our micro. Nothing is connected yet. So let's start uh, from connection of the debug interface. So system core says serial wire. We see that uh, two pins has been already assigned. So this is the uh, first point. Uh, then uh, we need to connect uh, USART 2, which is uh, connected internally to the S-Link. So we go to the connectivity. USART 2, we select asynchronous mode, and then we see that uh, PA2 and PA3 are assigned to USART 2 TX and RX functions, and those two pins are connected to 
Esteling on the Esteling EU third, and then are visible uh, with a virtual comport on PC once we connect our nuclear board uh, to, uh, to, the, to, to, to PC. Okay, so uh, we've got a connection to USART, and now we can configure our USART uh, parameters. So let's configure the, the parameters. I would propose to keep uh, 115,000 uh, bits per second as a bit right. A uh, work length, uh, it's including parity. I would use uh, 8 bits and uh, let's use even parity. Let's keep uh, stop bits uh, to one as a default uh, default uh, settings. Uh, we will not uh, do any additional configuration, so we can generate the project. I will just save the projects by Control S. So there is a question whether we would like to generate the code. I would click remember my decision and select yes. On the left part of the screen, we can see that our template is filled uh, with newly generated uh, source files. OK, so now we need to uh, go into the source uh, and the main.c file, which is the main uh, file containing the, uh, the sources which are executed after the reset. And uh, within the main procedure, uh, we can see that we've got uh, some uh, initial configuration within the hull in it, then the clock configuration, which we kept as a default setting. Uh, so our system is clocked by HSI, so high-speed internal oscillator, which is 16 megahertz. And uh, then we've got the initialization of the GPIOs and our USART uh, 2. What we need to do right now, we need to transmit in some area data uh, over the USART. So to do this, uh, I would use our while one loop where I would put the function from USART uh, domain. So call underscore UART control space. And now I can see a lot of functions which are typical for G0 family, those with suffix EX, but uh, I would select something typical, something easy. Uh, so I would like to transmit something without any IT, without any DMA. So I would select just simple how you are to transmit. The first argument is a handler to do what we would like to use. Then the pointer to the data we would like to send, then the size of those data, and the timeout in milliseconds we would like to wait till the function will complete. Uh, so the first one will be UART2. The second one, instead of the buffer, I would just specify the uh, name. It would be test, oops, sorry, test space. And the size, uh, it's uh, for it's five letters plus uh, the end uh, of the of the string, so it will be six. And the timeout, let's uh, put uh, for example one hundred milliseconds. Okay, to be sure that uh, the function would be co would be executed correctly without any errors, uh, I would propose to check its return value. And in case of any trouble, let's call the function, which is already generated, its error handler. Uh, it is. Uh, it can be called in all of the cases when the HAL function is uh, returning value different from HAL OK, which is the proper execution of the of the HAL function. <laughs> okay, so I use if, then, it's not equal HAL OK, then execute error. I will just correct the typing. Okay. To not block our our microcontroller, I would use some delay function at the end. How delay? Let's uh, put here 500 milliseconds to make this uh, string display uh, visible. Okay, so this is all uh, from the coding side. Uh, let's try to compile the code. So I would build it. Okay, and now let's try to run a debug session. I select STM32 MCU C++ application. This is the time I can change something, some configuration within the debug. I keep the default settings. And now I will switch to um, the debug uh, perspective. Now we need to turn on the terminal window. And now being in a console window, 
now we are in a debug perspective, so we can see uh, the dedicated debug uh, tab with resume, pause, search of suspend and terminate a debug uh, session. Uh, in the in the bottom, we can see the window uh, with set of tabs. Uh, so console, registers, memory, outputs. Mm, we can set uh, more registers, tabs. Uh, and uh, important is uh, to select the console window, console tab. If you do not see any console, you can go to the window, show view, and console. Within the console tab, you need to go to the open console and select command shell console. Then select serial port, select new, uh, select uh, many connection uh, type. So I would select test test G0, then a serial port, which has been assigned to your nuclear port, in my case it is COM31, baud rate, like set in our configuration, within the device configuration, so it was 115,000, data size, it, it was set to 8, including parity, so I would set to 7, because we are using even parity, and the stop bits is 1. I click finish, I can select as well the encoding, one of the three options we've got here, but I do not use any special characters, so I use the default setting, and then I press OK. So I can see that my terminal is connected. Now, if I run the application by pressing the resume button, I can see once per half a second the text I would like to display. Uh, now uh, I can disconnect the terminal, just pressing this icon, I can connect it once again, it will con continue. Uh, please be careful, once you disconnect the terminal and then you forget to close uh, close uh, the, uh, the console. Because in this case, if you try to create a new terminal application, it will be not possible. It will be not possible because uh, there is already open connection uh, on different name, on the same uh, serial port. Thank you for watching this video. Hello and welcome on our STM32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this module, I will demonstrate to you how to add the FreeRTS middleware software to the project based on STM32 microcontrollers using STM32 Cube IDE. So the objectives for this part are the following. First, we'll configure two IOs, PI5 as a GPIO output to control green LED, and PC13 as a GPIO XT13 to monitor the blue button, which is connected connected to the board. Then uh, we will add the FreeRTOS middleware to our existing project. And within this FreeRTOS, uh, I would add two tasks and one binary semaphore, uh, which would be controlled by our blue button. Let's start uh, with the new project on stm 32 Cube IDE. I would use an existing uh, workspace when I've got already some ready projects. I'm creating the new project, uh, so I go to File, New, STM32 Projects. It will start uh, from the uh, device uh, device selector. I'm selecting uh, STM32G071RB microcontroller, version LQFP64, which is used on our Nucleo board. I press next and then the name of the projects I propose G0 G0 free RTOS. I select target language as C, binary type executable, and we will use STM32 Cube to uh, set project type. I press finish and now we will be switched to the device configuration uh, window. Okay, uh, so let's start. Uh, uh, from enabling the debug uh, interface pins. So I go into the system uh, core, uh, sys, serial wire. I can see that both pins are selected as uh, debug uh, interface ones. 
Uh, second uh, step is a proper configuration of our IOs we would use. The first one is a PA5 when we've got our green LED connected. If I would uh, put into the search PA5, uh, I can see a blinking uh, PA5 uh, pin, so just to find it more easily. Uh, I press left button on this uh, pin and I'm selecting GPIO output. Uh, then I need to specify its label just to have a, a more easy configuration within the coding process. So I press the right button on mouse, selecting enter user label, and uh, I would uh, name it as a LED green. The next step uh, is a configuration uh, of our pin connected to the blue uh, button. It is PC13. So again, left button on mouse. And this time we will select GPIO XT13 because it would be an external interrupt. Please do not worry on this red uh, highlight over here. It means that uh, we have used this pin, uh, so it will be not available for other functionalities like System Wake Up 2. If I would go with the mouse over this red uh, component, I should see the information. What is the reason of highlighting this pin? There is nothing to be worried at the moment. We come back to our pin and over this pin we click the right button on mouse and select user label. We will name it as a blue button. Okay, so this is um, the second component. So from hardware point of view, we create, we configured all of the peripherals. So we go to the middleware, free RTOS, and we can select the interface. At the moment, uh, for the G0 family, there is only CMC's V1 library uh, available. This CMC's V1 means that uh, over the original free RTOS API, we've got the additional layer, which is called CMC's OS. So we select uh, CMC's uh, V1, and uh, within the configuration window, we can see a lot of a lot of new tabs related to free RTOS. First two, I mean uh, config parameters and include parameters, are important because uh, it's uh, in fact creating the uh, skeleton of the operating uh, system and uh, it's, it reflects uh, the main configuration file within the FreeRTOS, which is FreeRTOS config.h file. Using uh, config parameters, uh, we can select the type of the kernel, whether it will be it will use preemption or not. Uh, we can specify the tick rate, maximum number of the priorities of the tasks, then minimum stack size uh, for the component. Please be aware that it's given in words. Then the maximum task name length, it's 16 signs. Then we can enable or disable some additional functionalities like mutexes, recursive mutexes, counting semaphores, uh, tickless mode, uh, which is used for low power applications. We will not uh, change anything in this area. Uh, important component is a memory management settings uh, where we are specifying the total RAM memory area, which would be used uh, for the free RTOS. Please be aware that this time it is given in bytes. Uh, so three kilobytes we've got at the moment, and the memory management scheme. Uh, we can select uh, this memory management scheme from HIP1 to HIP5. Uh, we've got a dedicated session on the free RTS uh, within our channel, so you can have a look for more details on each uh, memory management schemes. The most uh, flexible one is, uh, in fact, uh, HIP4. If you would like to use the HIP memory, which would be allocated on different RAM areas, please have a look on the HIP5 instead. It will be not our case, so I would select the most popular one, HIP4. Then uh, the important point uh, is uh, the last two uh, parameters. The first one is uh, library lowest interrupt priority. Those two components are used to properly cooperate uh, with the interrupts which are present in the microcontroller world. The first one, library lowest interrupt priority, is the lowest possible interrupt priority which is available in the in this particular microcontroller. As it is a Cortex M0+, Plus, the lowest possible priority is free. And this lowest interrupt priority is used uh, for the interrupts related to the context switch 
and the tick interrupt used by the operating system. To be sure that all of the hardware interrupts are processed in proper way, operating system uh, is operating on the lowest possible priorities, just not to interfere with uh, hardware events. Uh, so this is the lowest possible priority for the system itself. The second parameter is used uh, to set the maximum interrupt of the priorities, which can still execute the uh, functions of operating system. Please remember that in uh, Cortex-M uh, devices, uh, lowest uh, priority means highest number. So in this case, I would propose a small change. Instead of three, we will put two. So the task switching and the tick interrupt would uh, have uh, lowest possible priority, number three, while uh, interrupts, uh, which we would like still to execute the operating system functions, would have uh, interrupt uh, priority two. Other interrupts, uh, which we would like uh, to be completely independent from the operating system, uh, will have uh, interrupt priority zero. So in this case, uh, all the hardware interrupts would be not interrupted by the operating system. So this is the basic configuration of the operating system. Let me remind you that all of the operations, all the configurations we are doing here, would be stored later on in a free RTOS config.h file, which is the main configuration file of the free RTOS. The next file is used to include uh, some additional functionalities, some additional functions to the operating system. This is used to add some additional functions to the operating system. The drawback of adding new functions is that we would use, we would use some additional code space. So if it's not necessary, we can remove some functions to save some code space. We will not use any additional, additional new. We will keep everything as a default setting at the moment. The next uh, next point is to add two tasks. We go to the task and queues tab. At the moment we've got only one task, it is so-called default task, which is created automatically. We will change this default task to our task one. Just double click using uh, left button and mouse on this name and uh, you should see the edit window. So we will change the default task name into the task one. Uh, we will keep uh, OS priority normal. We've got seven types of uh, priorities, uh, starting from priority idle, which is the lowest possible, and uh, ending with uh, so-called real-time. Normal is uh, somehow in the middle, so let's use uh, priority normal for both tasks. Uh, stack size, uh, it's uh, set on 128 uh, words, so let's keep it like this. Entry function, which is the a function which would be called during the task execution. Uh, so instead of this uh, start default task, I would use something different, just task1 underscore app from application. The rest I keep uh, as a default. So this is the task1 and I would add task2 just pressing this add button. And again I've got a new task, so I change the name task to a priority normal, a stack size the same without change, 128 words, and uh, the function would be task to up. And okay, we've got two tasks defined uh, with the same priority, uh, with different functions which would be called during its uh, execution. So this is uh, this is the point number one. Now let's add this, uh, one binary semaphore, which uh, would be connected to our uh, external interrupt triggered by the blue button. To do this, uh, we need to uh, go into the timers and semaphores tab, and uh, we need to select uh, the binary semaphore. So below this binary semaphore empty space, we've got the add button. So again, we need to add some binary semaphore. We will change this name into the binary underscore sem. Allocation dynamic, we've got as well in some areas static. If we configure the settings of the operating system, we can uh, as well use the static memory allocation. Please have a look 
that, uh, for example, in case of the timers and counting semaphores, we cannot add anything. Uh, options are uh, not accessible due to the fact that uh, within the config uh, parameters we have not enabled those components. Uh, please have a look uh, if I would come back to the config parameters and I would scroll down. Uh, I would scroll down and uh, I would select use timers from disabled to enabled and then come back to timers and semaphores timers became accessible. Okay, let me change it to disable uh, uh, again. Okay, so we are done uh, with all of the settings of uh, operating system from this uh, device configuration window. Let's try to generate the code. I would just save uh, save the, the project. And please have a look. I've got a warning. I've got a warning telling me that uh, I should change the time-based source uh, for HAL library from Sysdig, which is the default setting, uh, to some other timer. This is done due to the fact that Sysdig uh, is used uh, by the operating system, FreeRTOS, as a tick uh, timer. And it should not be mixed uh, with the HAL library usage, because in HAL, uh, Sysdig is used uh, to generate all of the delay functions and timeouts and it should not be mixed up. Okay, so this is highly recommended to change the time-based timer for the HAL library. We can use it within the sys, system core and sys tab. And uh, here, at the last point, we've got the time-based source. I can select any of the timers which are available in the system. Uh, what I would recommend to you is to use either timer 6 or timer 7. Both of those timers uh, contains only the time base uh, component, uh, so they can generate um, the interrupt on overflow. And those timers uh, do not have any input nor output channels, so the potential loss would be uh, minimum in this case. I would select timer 6, and uh, please have a look if uh, now I would go into the timer 6, uh, timers sections, I can see timer 6 unaccessible inaccessible because it has been used as a time base for our application. Okay, let's try to generate the code once again. So I would uh, control, uh, I would just save the project. And now on the left side, we should see uh, switches. The project would be generated. We can see that middlewares folder has been added. Uh, if I would scroll it down, I can see the subfolder third party, then FreeRTOS source, and then um, below uh, you can see the, the main file is a list.c, which is in fact the, the main file uh, which contains the functions uh, related to the scheduler, which is the heart, the core of the operating system. Then the semaphores uh, and the queues are stored, the functions for these are stored within the queue.c file. Uh, all of our tasks uh, are stored within the task.c uh, file. Timers is used for the timer semaphore. Uh, then we've got additionally the stream buffer. Uh, we've got uh, event groups uh, to communicate uh, between, the ti uh, be between the tasks and coroutines, which are not used in our architecture. Coroutines are used in uh, 8-bit or 16-bit architecture and requires less resources uh, from the uh, embedded system. Uh, in our case, we will use uh, full version, so we will use tasks, uh, so this uh, file will be not used. So this is the core, it is completely independent uh, from the embedded system, from the application, from the system when, where it has been added. The connection between our hardware, our stm 32 g 0 and um, FreeRTOS is done uh, within the portable folder. Here we can see GCC and memory management uh, folders. In memory management folder, we can see only one file, uh, one file with the name uh, which has been selected in the device configuration. And this uh, heap underscore 4.c file contains the functions to allocate and deallocate the memory, the RAM memory, for operating system uh, components. Uh, so this is strictly related to the, to the hardware. And then within the GCC, 
we've got subfolder arm cm0 so it's uh, for our um, uh, core which is the, the, the heart of our stm32 g0 uh, inside we can see two uh, files port.c and port macro.h those two files contains the functions which are connecting the interrupts uh, from the real hardware uh, with uh, the functions from the operating system. So this is the real interface between the embedded system which we are using and the operating system we have just added. We will not modify any of those files. All of the modifications of the code which we will do should be done within one of the two uh, files. The first one is app underscore free RTS and main.c uh, file. If we go into the main.c file, we can see it as a standard uh, cube IDE or cubemix generated file with some add-ons uh, related to uh, used operating uh, system. So we can uh, see within the private function prototypes, for example, uh, the two functions, which would be called uh, when the task one or task two would be executed. So those names has been defined by us within the task configuration, task tasks add on uh, within the configuration of the free RTS in a device uh, configurator. So within the main, you can see that uh, we're starting with HAL init, call configuration, GPIO init, and all the peripherals which we would like to init uh, would be in this area. Then below, we can see the preparation of um, the components of the operating system which we have added. So for example, binary semaphore, uh, tasks, and uh, at the end of this process, uh, we've got one single function to, to start the scheduler. It is OS kernel start. After this call, only the tasks which are active uh, would be executed one by one, and we sh should never land below this line. If we land below this line, we've got some problems uh, with the uh, RAM memory allocation. Uh, if we go below, we can see both uh, task uh, application functions defined as empty uh, functions with an infinite loop inside because uh, tasks functions should be defined in such a way that it contains the infinite loop inside as a mini main uh, functions. This is how it looks like and now this is the time uh, to add some code uh, modification into our generated code. Now let's back to the NVIC settings. Before we will generate the code, uh, let's have a look on the NVIC, uh, so interrupt uh, configuration. So within the system core NVIC, I can see some new settings. So we've got, I've got a new uh, column over here, uses free RTS function, which means that uh, I can select which interrupt uh, would be allowed to call the functions of our operating system. As we can see from this configuration, the lowest possible priority, so number three, is assigned to two interrupt uh, procedures. The first one is a system tick timer, so SysTick, which is used uh, to generate the tick interrupt, and the second one is a pendable request for system service, so pend SV which is uh, used uh, to switch the context uh, from one task uh, to the other. Both of them have the lowest possible priority to do not interfere, to do not block any hardware interrupt within the embedded system. Some of the interrupts uh, have the priority number zero, as you can see. Those are very important ones and should not be blocked by the operating system. So we've got non maskable interrupt, we've got half-fault interrupt, uh, we've got as well time-based interrupt coming from timer 6, which would be used by the HAL library. The rest of the interrupts uh, has been set uh, with the priority number 2, which means that it will be possible to execute the operating system from those interrupt routines. It is visible on this last column over here. If I unclick this, the interrupt priority would change immediately to 0, which means that this function would be above the operating system and uh, this interrupt uh, routine should not interfere with the operating uh, system. I would change it once again and what we are missing here is uh, in fact uh, enabling the interrupt from our blue button so xt line 13. I'm enabling this its priority is 2 
So it means that uh, we would like to execute functions from the operating systems from this, uh, from this interrupt. Okay, now we can generate the code. Okay, so let's uh, come back to our coding and let's change the default uh, task application functions. Within the task one, we would like to turn on green LED and then go to the blocked state for one second. So I would go to this uh, for loop and I would uh, just set the green LED to the high state. Right pin and then we've got uh, LED, LED green port. Then the pin, let green pin and the pin state GPIO pin set. So this is turning on our green uh, LED and then we will wait uh, for one second. Please have a look that I'm not using uh, HAL delay but OS delay. The difference is that HAL delay would block us for one second within this function, while OS delay is um, changing the state of our task uh, from running mode to the blocked uh, one, which allows uh, operating system to switch to the other task, which has some job to be done within this, uh, this time. So this is uh, not wasting any time. Operating system is immediately uh, changing the active task from our, uh, which is going to blocked state uh, to the other, which is much more uh, efficient. So this is the step uh, number uh, one. Step number two uh, would be to do the similar operation with uh, task number two, but in task number two, we will just switch off the task the, the LED, and this time we will do some modification of OS delay, just not to, to be the same time. So I'm uh, sw switching it off and waiting uh, for some uh, time. Come back to GPIO configuration. After configuring the GPIOs and uh, its mode and labels. Let's have a look uh, whether we've got the proper configuration of uh, external interrupt uh, input. By default, it is configured as an external interrupt mode uh, with rising edge trigger detection, while uh, in our application, the blue button is connected in such a way that it should be active on a falling edge. This is why we need to change it uh, to external interrupt mode with falling edge and trigger uh, detection. We will do the following uh, modification. Instead of using uh, OS delay function uh, within the task uh, one, we will go into the blocked state uh, waiting for the semaphore. So I would command this line and instead of this, uh, I would wait uh, for the semaphore. So I would uh, use the function OS, semaphore, control space, and then wait. We've got the uh, binary sem handle, semaphore, and milliseconds. I would put, use here the value OS wait forever. Uh, OS wait forever is in fact, if we have a look, uh, it's in fact the maximum value for 32-bit uh, variable. And uh, how, it is, how it is working? This function is uh, sending our task into the blocked state, inactive blocked state, uh, for the time uh, till the semaphore will come, will be released, or the timeout will elapse. In this case, uh, it will be quite long. This is why this is OS wait forever. So we will uh, we will wait uh, till the, the semaphore would be released. And uh, where we should uh, release the uh, semaphore? To release the semaphore, we need to go for a while into the G0 underscore itc.c file where we will find the external interrupt routine for our uh, microcontroller. I can find this function within the halgpio.c uh, file and I can see that uh, a HAL library is clearing all the flags 
and then once the flag is cleared is calling the proper callback. Uh, as we are uh, working with this external interrupt on falling edge, this would be the callback uh, which should be used by us. It is defined as an empty function with weak attribute, so we can redefine it within our piece of code. I would copy paste it, and within the main.c file, in this user code begin for user code end for, I would use this callback. Then we can check whether it was exactly the, 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 the pin we were looking for called, so I would put if, and then I would use this blue pin label. So if our variable so GPIO pin has been this uh, blue button pin, I would release the semaphore. So OS semaphore control space. So we need to release the semaphore. It's like with the traffic lights. Release the semaphore means that uh, I giving something, yes, which can be reused uh, afterwards by other component of the operating system, like task1. So the only argument here is a handler for this semaphore, this one, and that's it. One more uh, thing uh, on, this, on this point. Using this callback, uh, executing code within this callback is still done within the uh, interrupt routine of uh, external interrupt uh, from line 13. This is an important point uh, because uh, please uh, remember that our hardware interrupts should not interfere with the operating system. The cooperation between uh, hardware interrupts and operating system functions should be done in a careful way. The big advantage of the CMC's uh, layer is uh, that the CMC's library is taking care of selecting proper function if we are calling the operating system function from the uh, normal code or from the interrupt routines. If we have a look into this function, if we have a look on this function, this uh, in cmc's os.c, not .h, it is coming unfortunately to the header file, not. We see that uh, it is checking at the beginning if we are in a handler mode, so in the interrupt routine, or we are in a normal code. From uh, interrupt routine, it is calling a different. Uh, free RTOS API function with from ISR suffix, which is checking whether there was any any component, any task woken up by this event, by this semaphore. And if yes, it is checking whether there is a need to change the context uh, to different uh, task, which could, has been just woken up. Uh, so this is an important point that using CMC's OS layer, we don't need to take care about uh, selecting a proper function. It is done automatically by mm, the API. Okay, so uh, coming back to our code, we have just added this semaphore. Let's try to compile the code. So now uh, the task one, which is uh, responsible for turning on the LED, uh, would wait uh, for the semaphores, for the, uh, which would be released by the pressing the button. In the meantime, uh, only the task 2, which is turning off the LED, would be active. So now if I will go into the, into the debug mode, and run the code. Okay, so we will switch uh, Timer assisting to timer 7. Please have a look that timer 7 disappeared from available timers. And now if we save uh, and generate the code, we should have a new file, stm 32 g 0 xx time based time, which contains the functions to suspend tick, resume tick, all the functions which are used by the HAL library uh, to generate the timeouts and delay functions. And now if we uh, compile the code of semaphore added, in the meantime we can have a look on uh, interrupt C routine. We see that uh, timer 7 IRQ handler has been added. If we go to the debug mode, uh, I start the application. I can see my LED turn on for a while and then turn off because the timer the, the task 2 is on active task 1 which is turning on led is not active waiting for the semaphore 
which can be given by the drop triggered by the blue button. I press the blue button and for a while uh, the green LED is uh, turned on and then turned off because task 2 is uh, taken into, into account. So that's it uh, for, this, uh, for this exercise. Thank you for watching this video.